All right, we're, uh, we're going to talk about uh, ancient Jewish marriage and why ancient Jewish marriage is important to you. That seems a bit strange, doesn't it? Um, so if you've got your Bibles, you can turn to Luke, uh, Luke chapter 7. So we know in the New Testament we hear a lot about um, how our uh, relationship with God, um, you know, we're, we're referred to as the bride um, and uh, Christ is referred to as the bridegroom. Um, and um, you know, we read about uh, you know, parables like the ten virgins and, and uh, the applicable nature of that to you know, being prepared and ready for our own salvation. Um, and uh, you know, marriage ceremonies today are obviously very different uh, to what they were many, many years ago. Um, but when we look into the history of uh, ancient Jewish marriage, um, it's, uh, it's quite interesting. And the relationship between that and God's promise uh, is pretty amazing. So that's what we're going to go through tonight. Um, and so ancient Jewish marriage was basically two parts. Um, so you had what was called the betrothal or uh, erusin in Hebrew and then the ceremony. Um, which was a which was a separate part, um, and so I'm just going to do a side by side comparison of what happened in ancient Jewish marriage and what we see um, for our promise. So the first part of uh, of marriage uh, in the ancient uh, Jewish tradition was the betrothal, um, and it starts off with the father um, sending a servant, and he sends a servant out to find a bride um, for the bridegroom, um, and it's not perhaps like today where you, know, you find someone, you're attracted to them, you think they're cute, you know, and you, you know, look at each other across the room and, um, and that's how it starts. No, it didn't start like that, right? So the father sends the bridegroom out, um, and, uh, sends a servant out. Um, and, of course, the father's generally going to act in the best interest of, the, uh, of, his, of his son. Um, but often they were arranged marriages and they were arranged because um, uh, you know, getting two families together you know, uh, you know, through, through marriage was good for you know, economics. You know, we combine our stuff and your stuff or it might be good for, um, uh, for the region or it might be good for um, you know, strengthening your tribe. Um, and, uh, uh, and we read in, in Genesis 24, the first example that we have of a, of a, of a marriage. Um, but just stay, I'll just read it out from here. You can stay in Luke 7. Um, and uh, Genesis 24 actually goes into a lot of detail about uh, what a Jewish marriage uh, looked like or an ancient Jewish marriage looked like. Um, but a lot of the references that I've got are not just in the Bible but also based on other things, uh, other, uh, other traditions. And in, um, uh, so, in, so we see here in Genesis 24 that Abraham, um, when he was old uh, and stricken with age, the Lord blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of the house that ruled over... Um, uh, sorry, verse 3, and it says, And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God, God of heaven and the God of earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son and the daughter of the Canaanites, but thou shalt go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. So Abraham sent out his, his um, best servant or, or his most trusted servant to go and find, go, go and find a wife. Um, and we read in Luke um, 7, we read about this guy, John the Baptist. Right, and we know that um, in in Isaiah it actually talks about um, the voice that crieth in the wilderness, "Prepare ye the way of the Lord." And we know that that's what John the Baptist did. He prepared the way for Jesus, or he prepared the way for the for the bridegroom. And in verse uh, 24 of Luke 7, it says, "And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. What went you out into the wilderness for you to see? A reed shaken in the wind. Behold." What went you out for to see a man clothed in soft raiment um, and live uh, that they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately and are in king's courts? But what you went you out to see a prophet? Yea, I say unto you, he's much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except um, it be given from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So here we see the first example of the comparison between um, our salvation and what we see in, uh, in ancient uh, Jewish um, uh, Jewish uh, marriage. Um, I'll get you to turn to Second Corinthians chapter 6. 
So the next uh, thing that would happen was that they would tend to try and marry within the clan where possible. Um, and the reason for that was because um, if they married outside the clan, there was a risk that they introduced uh, foreign ideas and ideologies into the family. And so um, in, in Genesis it goes on and says, um, uh, but thou shalt go unto my ki country and to my kindred um, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said, Peraventure, um, uh, the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? And Abraham said unto him, Beware that thou not bring thy son hither again. So he was saying, if you can't find a wife from within the clan or within our, uh, within our people, then... Uh, we don't, we don't, I don't want the wife. And we see the same thing here in the uh, New Testament. There's a lots of examples about how we are to be uh, like-minded uh, and how um, we, should, um, uh, we should not really uh, unequally yoke ourselves outside the clan. And we read here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, and it says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light um, with darkness? And it talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it talks about that we're one body, that we're together, um, that we're unified, um, that, um, that uh, uh, by, by being uh, together aligned in, uh, in our ideology, aligned in our, in our thinking, that uh, we can be truly um, together. Um, and uh, bonded together. And so we need to be like-minded um, with Christ. Um, okay. The next... I'm going to turn to First Peter chapter 1. So there was... So the servants found a wife. She has to consent, right? So they didn't drag her back um, kicking and screaming. Um, and, uh, and in Genesis it goes on and says, And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath. Only bring not my son hither again. And they called Rebekah uh, and said unto her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. And we read also in the New Testament, um, in John chapter 4, which says, But the hour comes and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and the and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that must worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so we need to respond to the calling just like um, the bride responded. We need to respond and be prepared to go where Christ wants us to go. Okay, the next, the bride price. Um, we don't really understand concept of bride price here in Australia uh, anymore. Um, but there are countries around the world where bride price, price still exists. Um, I was in Papua New Guinea a few years ago, and they still have bride price, um, which I think was about sort of four or five cows, um, was sort of the average, uh, the average uh, bride price. Um, and it was called Moha, the bride price. Um, and it wasn't always paid in cash. Now, sometimes you know, it was paid for in kind or in service. Um, and in Genesis it goes on and says, And the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebekah um, as the bride price. Um, what do we read in the New Testament about bride price? Well, we know that Jesus paid the price for us, don't we? We read in John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He gave his life. That was his bride price for you. Just like Rebecca got a bunch of jewels, you got something even greater. Romans 5 says, But God commended his love towards us in that while we were sinners, he died for us. Um, First Peter says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of the lamb without blemish and without spot. So that was the price that was paid uh, for you. Okay, the next thing that uh, was uh, bestowed um, by the uh, groom's family was uh, matan, the gifts. Um, and, um, and these were often given uh, you know, to the bride and sometimes, in, uh, uh, and these were obviously in addition to the mohar or the bride price. 
um, and uh, they're often given to the family as well. Uh, and we read in Genesis 24, and it says, He gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. Um, now, you should be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where we read about the gifts uh, that we have uh, been bestowed upon us. And so this is separate to the price that's been paid. Um, and 1 Corinthians 12 verse 8 says, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing. Who's been healed here through the gift of healing? Um, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kind of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things. So the same Spirit that we've been bestowed upon us works these things, distributing to each one individually uh, as his will, as he wills. In Romans 6 verse 23 we read, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. <clears throat> okay, the groom. So in almost all of the cases where the servant was sent out and found the potential bride and she said yes, the bride actually hadn't seen the groom. She had no idea, right? No idea what he looked like. Could have been ugly. Could have been good looking, right? Bit of a, bit of a lottery um, on that day. Um, and um, we read in Genesis 24, and it says, And Rebekah arose and her damsels and, damsels, and they rode upon the camels and followed the man, and the servant took Rebekah and went his way. So she hadn't seen him. She had no idea. And she picked up her, you know, her damsels, and off they went, packed up all her stuff, um, and she headed, um, she headed to, to meet her groom. Um, well, guess what? We actually haven't seen our groom yet, have we? We know he exists. We see the benefit. We've received the gifts. We know he's paid the price. Um, we know he exists. We've seen his power. We've seen his glory. But we've not actually seen him just yet. And we read um, in First Peter chapter 1, it says, In whom having not seen you love, in whom though now you see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with, unspeakable, with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And so just like the bride's, uh, of ancient Jewish marriage, we also haven't seen our groom just yet, but we will. Okay, the next part is the contract. So it was called a ketubah. Um, I think that's how you say it. Um, so this was the out. Uh, this was the actual contract that was given, um, and it outlines the the groom's obligations to the bride. Um, and uh, it's considered a you know, pretty integral part of the, the Jewish marriage um, and it really protects the rights of the bride um, by specifying you know, the, those obligations. Um, so I'm going to just read here a little bit um, of a story that they found at the beginning of the 20th century. They found the oldest Jewish uh, marriage record on, on, uh, that they, that's uh, been uncovered um, from around about the time of the ba Babylonian exile. Um, and it was uh, discovered sort of near the southern border of Egypt. Um, and it was a marriage contract of um, uh, uh, Mibtakia, who was the bride, and Azhor the groom. Um, and it began as a declaration of marriage by Azhor to her father. And it says, I came to thy house for thee to give me thy daughter to wife. And she is, uh, uh, she will be my wife, and I am her husband from this day and forever. And following that sort of dec declaration of betrothal, um, all the terms of the marriage contract were written out uh, in detail. Um, and he paid the father five shekels um, as a mohar, or the, the bride price, um, for the daughter. Um, and in addition, um, she received... Uh, so, so that was to the father, and then the, the bride received 65 and a half shekels um, uh, as well. And according to the marriage contract, the bride had equal rights to her husband... Um, she had her own property, which she could uh, bequeath as she pleased, and she had the right to pronounce a sentence of divorce against Azhor, Azhor, even as he had the right to pronounce it against her. So they were the things that were in this, were in this contract. Um, this is your contract. Right? This is the contract that we have. Right? This is the contract that we've been given um, for our marriage. Um, and we read um, in this all of the promises that God has for us. And they protect us 
And so we talk, we hear in, we read about, um, you know, that he would never leave us or forsake us, that he would comfort us. We read um, about uh, how he would take our burdens and provide rest for us, that he would provide our daily needs if we put him first. We read about uh, the healing and protection that we are promised. Uh, we, are, we read about the salvation uh, that he will, uh, he will give us and we read about uh, the Holy Spirit uh, and what that would do for us and the promise that, that, that we would have the Holy Spirit um, should we ask. And so these are the, the protections that you have on God's promises. They're here written for you and they are promises that are unrevocable just like Azhor couldn't revoke the uh, promises that he made in his marriage uh, contract, God even has a higher calling to not revoke uh, the promises that we have uh, in here. Um, Mark chapter 12, I'll get you to turn to, verse 29. And so typically, um, once the betrothal uh, had happened, um, the woman was legally married at that point. So even though they hadn't had the marriage ceremony, she was legally bound um, and remained, she typically remained in her father's house until the actual wedding ceremony itself. And she couldn't belong to another man um, unless she actually went through the process of divorce, right? even though they officially haven't. Um, and we read, um, uh, we read uh, in... Uh, Mark 12, verse 29, it says, And Jesus answered him uh, and said, The first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou that shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart uh, and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. And this is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely, this shall, they shall love thy neighbour as thyself. There is none other greater commandment than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God and there is none other. But he, so just like the bride, um, who's been betrothed, we are betrothed also, and we are to have no other gods but our God. Um, and uh, we read in Luke 16, which says, uh, "No man can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one uh, and despise the other. You cannot serve God and Mammon." So that's our calling also. Uh, I'll get to turn to Luke chapter 22, verse 17. So after the um, marriage uh, contract or covenant was drawn up and agreed, um, it would be sealed between a toast, between the, gro the groom and the bride. But um, uh, back then, the groom would pour the wine uh, for the bride and offer it to uh, his bride, and hopefully she took it, um, because that was sort of the, the final part of this process. Um, and to accept the marriage, she would, uh, she would drink it um, and... Um, uh, she could request, uh, she could reject it, obviously, um, but because uh, ultimately it was her decision. Um, and once she'd partaken of that cup, uh, the groom, um, after the proposal was accepted, would promise not to drink um, uh, the wine, would not not to drink wine until the bride, um, until he saw the bride again on the wedding day. We read here in uh, Luke chapter 22. Um, verse 17 and it says here and he took the cup that's Jesus and gave thanks and said take this and divide it among yourselves for I say unto you I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come and so here we see a, another direct correlation to, uh, to you know, Jesus' return and ultimately our ultimate wedding day um, and uh, the bride uh, was supposed to, uh, until the wedding day, was, was encouraged to regularly drink small amounts of wine, each time reminding her that uh, the groom would be coming for her. And what do we do? What do we do today? We did the same thing as a remembrance, didn't we? Not only of his sacrifice, um, but also... Um, uh, of what was to come um, and like it says in Luke 22 likewise also the cup after supper saying this cup is the new testament in my blood which is shed uh, for you okay uh, I'll get you to turn to Romans chapter 5 so uh, as I said earlier you know in ancient times marriage was often a, uh, a, a marriage of a lion
reasons, um, or reasons of survival or, or practica uh, practicality. Um, and love wasn't really part of the original betrothal. Um, and it's not often why they came together. Um, and um, one of my favourite sayings is that love is not a feeling, it's an ability. Um, and, uh, uh, and we read here, you know, I'll just read here out of uh, Genesis, um, just that story about Rebecca. And it talks about how love grows, um, and it grows over time. And, um, uh, and Isaac brought her into his son, uh, into his mother Sarah's tent, and took Rebecca, and she became his wife, and he loved her, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Um, and we read, um, you know, that uh, in Romans 5, verse 8, it says here, But God command, commendeth his love towards us, in that while we were sinners, so before we could love Jesus, before we had even any acknowledgement, potentially, that he existed, he died for us. Um, and much more than, uh, than b being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And First John chapter 4 says, We love him. Why? Because he first loved us. And our love grows constantly, doesn't it? Our love for Jesus grows every day, right? As we bring ourselves closer to him through all of the things that we do, through our reading of, our, of, our, of the word, through our prayer, um, we, we become closer and our love for him grows. Uh, get you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Um, and so after the, um, after the betrothal process, the, the bridegroom leaves, he goes back to his father's house um, and he prepares a, a home or a room um, for his bride. Um, and through that time, she has to be set apart. It's a process called kala, um, and uh, uh, it literally means secluded or, or enclosed one, um, and the bride belonged to her, to her, to her groom, um, and, uh, uh, and he had to have, she had to have eyes for none other. Um, and it was probably easy for a bride in ancient Israel to keep her bridegroom foremost in her heart um, during the first few months. But uh, this process between when they had the betrothal and when the marriage ceremony happened often took about a year. Um, and so you can imagine, you know, if you're when you're dating here, right, you get to see each other all the time. You know, even if you live, you know, Emily and I did the long distance relationship with me, Mount Gambier, and her here, and we wrote a few letters and, and other things, and that was hard enough. But you imagine being apart for for a year. Um, and so uh, he had, she had to, you know, keep herself, um, and she obviously had the gifts to look at each day. Um, she had the the wine to to drink to remember uh, remember him. Um, uh, but she had to be separate. She had to be separate and set, set apart. And we read all the same things in, in the New Testament, don't we, about being set apart from this world, not being part of this world, not being conformed, not being sucked into the things that this world has for us. Um, you know, we read in Second Corinthians about you know, uh, to come out from them and be separate or not part of the old ways or the old religion. Um, we read um, uh, about glorifying God in our bodies, uh, in 1 Corinthians 6. Um, we read in 2 Peter chapter 3, which says, Knowing this first, that there should be come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So you can imagine you know, the bride, right? She's uh, back in her hometown, and uh, the local lads are going, Where's this, where's this bridegroom dude? Like, you know, he, it's been six months, he hasn't come back for you, how about you check up with me? Um, same thing for us, isn't it, right? Same process for us, that we need to remain separate and not be lulled into uh, this world. Why? Well, in, in 2 Corinthians it says, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Um, that's what we're called to do. Okay, um, Mark, uh, no, I won't get you to turn there. Um, so prior to the uh, wedding day, a, bli a bride was a, a bli obligated to immerse in water before the wedding, um, and that was called the mivka, which was an immersion. So they had a particular pool, like a little, you know, little dipping pool, um, and, and it had to contain enough water to cover her entire body. Um, and, um, well, 
we know what that signifies, don't we? Uh, we know that uh, we're called uh, to be baptised by full immersion the same way, um, for the same reason. Uh, we read in John 3, which says that except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter um, the kingdom of God. Um, so that's the baptism. So I'm, I said before that the groom went to prepare a house, uh, prepare a room, um, and um, uh, it was often in his father's house. So it was a room that was sort of se separate um, in his father's house. Um, and um, the, uh, uh, and he often didn't find a, you know, it wasn't as if that uh, he you know, built his own house. Um, and uh, we know that Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us, don't we? Um, we read here in John 14, it says, Jesus says, In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, uh, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there may you be also. And so you can imagine a groom of ancient Egypt's time saying the same thing to his, to his bride. I'm going to prepare a place in my father's house for you and when it's finished, I'm going to come back for you. And Jesus has said exactly the same thing um, to us. Um, what's interesting is the bride never, didn't actually know when he was going to come back. Uh, and so um, for that reason, she was told, and we read, um, uh, we read in, uh, in the New Testament actually, um, that she would have to keep her oil lamps ready um, to uh, just in case uh, the groom came in the night uh, and uh, he would come sounding what's called a shofar which is a ram's horn uh, and uh, when he returned um, uh, that's, uh, he did it with some you know, theatrical um, nature um, and of course we know the Lord uh, we read in, um, in Second Peter that the Lord will come as a thief in the night unexpected at a time when we're not ready um, so we're not expecting, um, just like um, it happened uh, with with these with these brides. And of course, we read about the parables of the ten virgins, which I'll, I'll let you read at another time. What the interesting part is that the groom didn't know when he was going to return either, and it wasn't actually up to him. He didn't go right. Paint's dry. I finished. The room's ready. I'm going to go and get my bride. It was the father who made the decision. His father made the decision whether or not he was ready to go back and get his bride. Um, and, well, guess what? We read in Mark 13, which says, But that of that day and that hour knoweth no man, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Same thing. All right, I'll get you to um, turn to First Thessalonians chapter 4. We haven't, we've only just got to the wedding. This, now we're up to the wedding part. Um, and um, uh, so, so, so the wedding is... Um, um, uh, it's called uh, nisuin, which comes from a word called nasa, which means to lift up or to bear or to carry. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, the groom with sort of much noise and fanfare, you know, comes and carries his bride home. Um, and um, they will recite a blessing over the wine um, and finalise their vows. Um, and then they would consummate their marriage and live together as husband and wife. Um, and so I mentioned before about the shofar, the horn, um, which... Uh, which gets uh, uh, which gets blown to announce the arrival. Well, of course, we read in First uh, Thessalonians, which talks about, for the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise. After the bridegroom uh, arrives, um, they drink the cup together, um, and uh, they finalise their vow by the drinking of the cup. Um, and, of course, we read before in Luke 22, which said that, um, uh, that Jesus said, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come, until that wedding day when we're presented to him. And then they live happily ever after. The wedding is over. They are together. You know, all this waiting and this process about you know, the coming together and the promises that were made uh, and, uh, and the diligence that they both had, um, they finally come together uh, and uh, they're bonded together um, in matrimony. And that's the day coming for us, isn't it? 
when the Lord returns and we hear that trump, um, that'll be the day. All of the things that we've gone through, all of our life, um, all of the promises that, that we read about in here, um, every single one of them will be, um, will be validated by the day that Jesus um, comes back. And uh, we will know then, we will finally see our, bride, uh, our bridegroom um, and we will be one with him. Amen.